So we're gonna get started up again into this final, we've hit the, the final stretch here. We're gonna talk about growing, the use of money to save and invest in order to meet short and long-term goals. And prepare yourselves for your thinking to be challenged. If you're doing anything out there in the investment world, just be prepared to be challenged in your thinking for a, a, new, trans, a new transformation of your thinking as we go through this, okay? So I know we'll have a few coming in as we continue here, but uh, let me on the next slide just refer you to another appendix to some practical aspects. We're gonna be talking more about the principles when we talk about investing. We have other aspects too to talk about saving, et cetera. But uh, here's just some very practical aspects of investing in practice. So be sure to take a look at that appendix. So now I do want to focus on growing as a faithful steward during our remaining time here. Very helpful proverb to start with. You say, but I don't have anything. I don't have an investment portfolio or whatever it is you're going to talk to me about. Well, here's the advice for all of us. Better a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and turmoil with it. Better to have little or nothing and know the Lord and understand the fear of the Lord than to have great treasure and the trouble and turmoil that can come with that great treasure. So just keep that in mind. Proverbs 15, 16. All right, we're going to start again with our, our final section that addresses spiritual transformation. Remember, heart of pride to a heart of gratitude, heart of coveting to a heart of contentment, heart of indifference to a heart of love, heart of impatience to patience. Now we want to focus on a heart of anxiety to a heart of trust. Having this anxiety over our future can be very debilitating. Have I prepared well for the future? Am I gonna have enough? How much do I need to save? How much needs to be there? And some of you are going, I just can't even do that at all. I don't even think about it because it's too overwhelming. Well, we need to have our hearts transformed from a heart of anxiety to a heart of trust. And we've already looked at multiple, multiple verses that would demonstrate our, our need for trust and rest and contentment in the Lord. But we want to re-examine that here as well. Okay, so let's look at, first of all, at a heart of anxiety. So a heart of anxiety can cause one to trust in riches for the provision of a safe and secure future rather than wholly trusting in God. Wealth can easily become an idol for those who are anxious and fearful evidenced by hoarding money for the future instead of exercising generous giving in the present. I can't give, it, I can't give that much. I, I gotta make sure that I have enough for the future when I can no longer work. I've gotta make sure. So it can often cause us to focus too much on the future rather than meeting needs of others in the present. There has to be a proper balance there. 1 Timothy 6.17, as we've already looked at 1 Timothy, Paul's instruction to Timothy, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Right there, that's the transformation that needs to take place. From a heart of anxiety that trusts in riches to trusting in God himself. And Paul plainly states here, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. God is the source of not only our present needs, but our future needs. Right? He didn't promise just to take care of you today. He promises to take care of you from now throughout eternity. Heart of anxiety even causes one to worry about the present 
as to whether or not there will be resources to provide for oneself and or one's family. Such people think far too little of their loving Heavenly Father. Not only are they worrying about the future, they're worrying about the present. But that just exhibits a heart, a lack of trust. Do you really believe what God says or not? If you are anxious and worrying, it evidences that you don't. You are not trusting him. But God, but God, but this, but that. No. Your father is a loving father. He cares for you. And he will care for you. He will continue to care for you. He will meet all of your needs. Going back to that passage that Jesus was teaching in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life. And think of the, the uh, conditions in place back when he is preaching this. They don't have prepackaged bread and meat in the grocery store, preservation of food. It's day to day. And what did Jesus teach the disciples to pray? Our Heavenly Father, give us this day our daily bread. Day by day, the Lord will take care of us. So we've got the ability now to purchase something that's going to be preserved for um, much longer than they do, and we still worry. We still worry about it. He says, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you by being worried can add a single hour to his life? Look at the birds. Are they provided for? Are you not much more valuable than them to your heavenly Father? Worry will do nothing. It will benefit you in any way, shape, or form whatsoever. It does nothing positive for us. Anxiety, worry, it does nothing for us. Who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? More than likely, you'll take off hours, right? Continuing there. And why are you worried about clothing? Observe the lilies of the, how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. And yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. Look at the beauties of just the flowers. God clothes the fields with the flowers. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? You lack trust. Do not worry then, say, what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Don't worry about the future. God has promised he'll take care of you today. And when tomorrow comes, he'll take care of you tomorrow as well. So the heart of anxiety causes one to hold money, whether that's little or much, tightly in a clenched fist. I got to hold on to this. If I don't, I'm going to lose it. Or somebody's going to take it from me or something's going to happen to it. I've got to maintain control. Instead of holding it with an open palm for the Lord to use as he pleases. So if we hold it like this, there's a false sense of control that just results in further anxiety. You're not benefiting yourself by doing this. This is going to cause more anxiety because now you're the one responsible to hold on to it. Job 121. 
no one went through greater trials than Job. Yet he said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's that last sentence, right, that really hits it home. He, he didn't react or respond by cursing the Lord. They said, blessed be the name of the Lord. It's up to the Lord to give and take. I've got to keep my hand open. I've got to allow him to either give or take. If I don't, I'm missing out because I'm causing my heart anxiousness and worry. And Job said, blessed be the name of the Lord. I worship you no matter what happens. Give or take. You do what is wise and what is best. The heart of anxiety lies to self, saying, if I just had a little more, I would be content. But that robs one of true contentment. I think it was asked of maybe Rockefeller or, I don't know, J. Paul Getty or Hearst or one of those. Um, I have to check my sources, but how much more is enough? What was the response? Just one dollar more. Just one dollar more. That's all I need, just one dollar more. Get that dollar, and what's the response? Just one dollar more. Never satisfied. Never fulfilled. First Timothy 6, back to that passage. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. As Job said, we brought nothing into the world, and so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. I mean, we all have to ask ourselves that. Are we content with just food and clothing? Would you be content if that's all that you had? Nothing else. But you had provision for the day. You had covering for your body. Would you be content? God, I don't need anything else. Remember, the Apostle Paul found that contentment even in, in Roman prison. So let's continue here. The cure for the heart of anxiety is placing one's trust fully and confidently in the Lord, the provider. Again, Cortinas and Bomber right here. In their journey towards trusting the Lord, they write here, our continual striving to control our finances caused us greater anxiety, not less. The path to freedom is not through more meticulous financial planning, but rather through finding greater trust in God's promises as our provider, both now and in the future. Nothing wrong with financial planning. I hope not, because that's what I do. Nothing wrong with that. But if you don't settle in your heart that God is your provider, he promises he will care for you, both now and in the future, then any amount of planning isn't going to help. It's not going to help settle your heart or provide, or provide contentment for you. Okay, so that's the heart of anxiety. Let's move to the heart of trust. The heart of trust places confidence in the Lord alone, which we just looked at, to, to provide both now and in the present as well as in the future. Lamentations 3.24, The Lord is my portion says my soul. When have you said that? When have I said that? The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. I don't need to place my hope anywhere else as long as I have the Lord. Place it fully and confidently in him. Whatever trial I'm going through, He's the one who brought me into that trial. He's the one who will take me out of that trial. Right? You can't mess with the sovereignty of God. His providential leading. Wherever you are, it's not a mistake. It is right where the Lord has led you and right where he wants you right now. 
And tomorrow the same thing, and the next day, and the next. Otherwise, what kind of a God do we serve? Is he not in control? Is he not sovereign? Is he not providential? If we say, God, this is wrong. What you're doing to me is wrong. We're accusing God of something we should never accuse him of. Being out of control. Out of sync with us. Versus us trying to find and understand why he has us, where he has us, when he has us, how he has us. The heart of hope, our heart of trust, looks longingly towards heaven and gazes at the wonder of the sun until all other things fade away, awaiting a glorious future with Christ. Wonderful passage here in Colossians 3. Therefore, if, and that could actually be translated, therefore, since you have been raised up with Christ. It's a fact. Keep seeking the things above where Christ is. Pause right there. There's a pause. Where Christ is. You're seeking Christ. That's where he is. And where he is, he is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on the earth. Oh, if we could just grab a hold of that. We set our minds so much on things here on the earth. It distracts us. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. No more secure place for me to be than hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Amen. Amen. Wonderful passage. Just take time to meditate on that. The truths, the deep truths, eternal spiritual truths that are found right there that are so practical for us today. The heart of trust is radically content, knowing that the Lord will never leave one of his own alone. Back to Hebrews 13. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money. Being content with what you have. Not with what you want or with what you don't have. Being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. That's the promise that we hold on to, right? So we can be radically content. Fear and anxiety are very real threats to our joy and contentment, and the only cure is to meditate on the promises of God's word, like the many passages that we've just looked at, that causes our minds to think biblically and our hearts to trust him fully. We were just talking about different series that we liked from Men of the Word, or we had great benefit from, and one of those is The Christian Mind, right? A series that Brad did. So if you were not part of that or didn't hear that, listen to that. Because we have to transform our thinking. Our minds must be transformed to think biblically and our hearts to trust Him fully, thereby, thereby allowing us to live generously rather than greedily. Cortinus and Baumer again. If we believe that we have a good Father and that everything Jesus taught is true, do we believe that? If we really do, there should be natural <coughs> outflow of that. If that's true, our response when anxiety and fear bubble up in our hearts should be one of trust as we remember who holds the future. Learning to trust God enables us to find authentic security and satisfaction in our true provider, opening the door to incredible unmatched joy he offers to those who choose to live not only fearlessly, but generously. There's so many benefits and results, not only for us, but for the body of Christ, if we will live this way. Because it allows us to free up our minds and our resources to say, God, maybe you want to redirect these elsewhere. 
maybe you want me to, to um, demonstrate generosity in such a way that it takes the focus off my future balance of my portfolio and meets needs in the moment now, demonstrating a greater trust in you. I don't know. I don't know what that means for you, but I'm just giving you possibilities here. Okay? And then as we've already talked about, the perpetual existence of poverty and wealth. There will always be wealth and people who are poor. People who are wealthy, people who are poor. There's always going to be an imbalance, if you will, between that. Okay? Poverty and wealth have always existed and will continue to exist. Poverty cannot be alleviated through taxes. Government should not be the agent of providing for the poor, but rather individuals and churches. Israel was called on to care for the poor, as are we in the church. To be generous to the poor and needy who are unable to provide for themselves or their families. It should also be noted that poverty due to laziness is always condemned in Scripture. So no excuses if you're just going to be lazy Say, well, I'm in need, so give to me. Well, not if you're lazy, right? Many verses here. I won't go through every single one, but just to demonstrate the plethora of verses that are available here regarding exist the existence of those who are poor and the existence of those who are wealthy and uh, the warnings against being lazy and how that can lead to poverty. Right, number of these here. I will point out number six. The rich and the poor have a common bond. The Lord is the maker of them all. We're all evenly created in the image of God, whether we are wealthy or poor. There is no hierarchy from God's standard when he looks down on his creatures on us, his human creation. He does not prize the wealthy above the poor. Right? We need to realize that. If he doesn't do that, we shouldn't do that. He's the maker of them all. Other verses there, I'm going to um, pause on a, in a, one on the next slide here, but you can look at those verses as you take a look at your notes. Okay, just to focus here, just to say from the Old Testament, for the poor will never cease to be in the land. Even under this theocracy, with God's, um, <clears throat> the law of Moses, God implementing that in the nation, even then, even in that nation, you're going to have poor people. The Lord makes rich, both poor and rich. He brings low, he also exalts there, 1 Samuel 2. Right? He is the one who providentially determines this. Focus here. Again, Jesus himself says, for you will always have the poor with you. Not under Israel's theocracy, under their economy, the poor would not be alleviated. Not now, even under Jesus' own ministry and into the future. Okay? So all of these social programs are not going to work. They're not going to alleviate the poor. That can, you know, really bankrupt a nation as it is doing to ours. So we're always going to have the poor. And so there's always the opportunity for us to care for the poor, to exercise generosity, to give. Okay? So let's shift gears a little bit here on saving for the future. It's like, well, John, you just told me that we don't need to worry about the future. Why are you now going to tell us to save for the future? Well, there is wisdom. There is wisdom here about preparing for the future and, and how God has designed for us um, to live, to use wise principles 
from Scripture, always under that umbrella of God is our provider. Okay, I'm not now shifting gears saying, okay, let's set that aside and let's do something different. No, even in our saving for the future, it's understanding God is providing even that for us. And we're relying upon him, not the bulk of money that we're going to save and set aside. But there are wise principles here that would give us um, good advice. For example, here, Proverbs 6. Okay, Solomon writing here to a son, go to the ant, O sluggard, observe her ways and be wise, which having no chief officer or ruler, prepares her fruit in the summer and gathers her provision in the harvest. There are cycles that God has built into his creation. Agriculture, right? There's times to plant, times to cultivate, time to harvest. And the cycle starts over again. Well, the ants do their preparation. They gather their food in the summer, or prepare the food in the summer and gather provision in the harvest. So the ant is a great example of, of work, of diligence, of preparedness. This little creature that God created that is being used in, as, as an example for us to examine and look at. Proverbs 30, verse 25, another reference to the ants. The ants are not a strong people, but they prepare their food in the summer. Learn from that. It's wise. So, introductory note of both wisdom and warning, what I've just been saying here, you can hear also from Cortinas and Baumer who write, write this, responsibly saving for the future is certainly wise, but many of us take it too far, either by allowing future what-if scenarios to cause us immense anxiety, or by oversaving in an attempt to control our own futures. Planning for the future is certainly wise, but setting our hope and security in our savings is costly. Again, taking your focus off the Lord who is our provider and focusing on the provision that he allows us to gather is costly to us. It deprives us of the joy of being generous here and now and dampening our trust in God, our one true provider. So again, we don't just save for the future for savings' sake and have no idea what we're saving for, why we're saving, a time horizon, the amount we're saving. We're just often in this mode, if we do save, we're just saving, saving, saving. And we often we're just hoarding. We're just hoarding. We don't know what kind of provision would be wise for the future or not. We're just hoarding and hoping we get more and more and more and just build it up. But we don't want to be like that rich man who said, I'm just going to tear down my barns and build bigger ones, put everything in there, and now live a life of ease. So that's not what our saving is for either. Okay? We want to have a right understanding of saving, but not so much savings that it robs us of the opportunity now to be generous. Does that make sense? Yeah, with me? I know it's post-meal. <laughs> make sure you're still with me here. Okay, so what's the point here? Be a generous giver first and a wise saver second. Put generosity ahead of that saving. Giving ahead of that investing. Right? So let's kind of define some terms here. Definition of savings. So saving can be defined as the amount of income left over after all expenses have been paid. So that margin we've created. According to this definition, savings can either be positive or negative. You know you can have a negative savings rate? Well, let's take a look here. So those who spend more money than they earn and use credit cards to finance additional purchases that are beyond their means will result in a negative savings rate. This is my income. This is my expenditure. That's negative. You're going backwards in that situation. But those who spend less money than they earn and live within their means have a surplus. 
resulting in a positive savings rate. Here's my income, here's my expenses. Now I've got that margin, that gap. So as it pertains to personal finance, saving typically refers to keeping the income remaining after all expenses have been paid and setting it aside for particular purposes and or to reach particular goals. I would argue that we should probably set aside the saving first because if we don't, we won't have anything left over. Spend it all. So remember those three jars I talked about for those, those of you who were last, here last week? Simple budget, giving, saving, spending. And that priority, right? We give first, we save, and then we spend. Because if you put any of those out of order, you're not gonna have anything left after spending. So spending first, well, there's nothing left to put in the giving and saving jar because you'll just spend it without even knowing it, right? So it must be in the right order, right priority, okay? So you're setting aside these funds for a particular purpose to reach a particular goal. That's why you're saving. Like I said, don't just save just to save. What are you saving for? Have goals in mind. And if we're getting you know, kind of technical here into the financial realm, the holding period for savings vehicles is typically less than a year. For example, a CD. Of course, you can have CDs that are greater than a year um, or no holding period at all. You know, like a CD, you're kind of tying your money up for a certain amount of time. Or you're putting it in a bank savings account, checking account, money market accounts. In other words, savings are typically held in liquid accounts. So we're getting on the practical side of things here. With liquid accounts, they're easily accessed with little to no waiting period, okay? So I'm saving, I'm typically thinking more shorter term, all right? So I'm saving for more shorter or maybe midterm goals. And I'm putting it um, in a place where it's gonna be very liquid, very accessible, okay? So again, I'm getting into the practical side of things as far as the saving goes. Savings vehicles also carry very little risk, considered safe, and I realize somebody will come back with me. What about the bank failures that have been happening lately and all this FDIC insurance? Well, we understand um, not even FDIC insured banks can fully secure our funds, right? There's no fully secure place here on earth. But typically speaking, a savings vehicle carries very little risk. It's safe. It's held in FDIC insured bank account, and because they carry very little risk, you're going to get little interest. I mean, a year ago, it was like 0 0.01, basically, and now we're up to, you know, maybe 4 4.5% four in, in an online savings account. So you're going to get some uh, savings, uh, some interest on your savings, okay? So if we were looking at a margin or, or a spectrum of risk, like over here, no risk at all. I just put the money in a jar or put it under my mattress um, to you know, putting some in the bank. And then I get over into the investing realm where I'm gonna take some more risk in the long term. Or I go even beyond that to the spectrum of, of speculating within this spectrum, spectrum. Or I even go to gambling. So that's kind of a risk spectrum very safe to extremely risky and even just throwing your money away through gambling, All right? So if there is a spectrum of risk, we're starting at the very, the more safe end and we're gonna work our way towards the investment end, okay? Just to kind of give you a bigger picture of, of where we're going here and why I'm focusing on this, all right? So savings can be apportioned between short-term goals and longer-term investments. So in other words, if we want to, we can define savings as a very broad umbrella that includes short-term savings and on out to longer-term investing. You could say that, okay? I typically, when I say save, um, I'm referring to a shorter-term kind of goals versus investing, where I'm taking more risk for longer-term for hopefully greater return over time, all right? 
but you can bring it all under one umbrella and call it all savings because you're in, sen in a sense you are saving for the future either way. Okay, does that make sense? I don't want to cause confusion, but hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so we've kind of defined savings here, this broad umbrella that can include short term and long term. When we get into maybe more of the details or the technicality of it, savings would maybe focus more in particular on the short term aspects versus longer term. Okay, saving, reasons for saving. Okay, why should I save for the future? If I see that the ant has a pattern of going through saving, there's reasons for that, right? Because the ant knows that there is a future need that must be met by gathering now. Because when that need is there, there's not gonna be any additional harvest. You don't prepare for that. You don't prepare ahead of time you're not gonna have anything when the need occurs. So that's what we're trying to do with savings. We're trying to meet a future need, whether that's very short term or intermediate or longer term. So first of all, practically speaking, what we would call an emergency fund. Typical guidelines advise individuals or couples to save three to six months of expenses in an emergency fund. This is just funds set aside for a rainy day. You don't know what the future holds. So you're setting aside funds. And again, remember, I am saying all of this with the understanding that God is our provider. And I'm not trying to foster a lack of trust in him by saying you should save for the future. No, you're saving because these are the wise principles he's given to us. There are going to be future occurrences in your life, future incidents that you have no idea are coming. And by having something like this, an emergency fund, it can prepare you to weather that storm. Right? You don't just set sail in a, a ship and say, oh, we're not going to load provisions. Right? We'll just, whatever we get along the way, we'll catch some fish. Don't know what we'll do about water if we're out in the uh, sea with salt water. We'll just let God provide. No, you gather provisions for the journey, right? You prepare well ahead of time so that you will have provisions when the need arises. Okay? So we're not fostering a lack of trust in God, but we're working within his economy, his design for things. All right? So, Proverbs 20, verse 4, the sluggard does not plow after the autumn, so he begs during the harvest and has nothing. He didn't prepare well for the future. So an emergency fund is put into place to meet expenses that are unforeseen and could be devastating if it were not in place. An emergency fund may be utilized need to be utilized due to loss of job or injury that prevents the income earner from working for a short period of time other unforeseen expenses that could be paid out of an emergency fund, maybe a major healthcare expense, car repair, home repair. All right, the refrigerator goes out. What are you gonna do? You don't have any emergency fund, you're gonna have to put it on a credit card. You have anything saved up, you're not gonna be well prepared. So you got this emergency fund site, okay, Lord, you provided this because I live in a fallen world and things are going to break down. And there's going to be accidents and there's going to be unforeseen events. So I'm doing this to prepare well for that. So you have that set aside. Is the anxiety gone? Yeah. Okay, I can handle this, Lord, because I've set aside funds for this. Rather than being shocked and surprised and wondering, left wondering what to do. As I've mentioned, um, these liquid accounts, something that's very accessible, no penalties, that's where you want to keep your emergency fund. You're not going to earn a super high rate of interest. Like I said, right now, because of inflation is high, uh, interest rates are high, an online high-yield savings account might yield you four plus percent. 
So that's a good place to keep this emergency fund. Very liquid, you're not risking it because you may need it at any time. You wanna risk funds that you may need at any time. Okay, so it could be in a high yield savings account, a short term CD at a bank. And if you're wondering where do I go to find this, go to bankrate.com. They'll give you and, and look at high yield savings accounts and there are several listed there um, that you'll recognize the names probably when you see them. Allied Bank, Capital One, um, Chase, um, others like that. So you can find good reputable banks that will have access to these high yield savings accounts. And they're, they're paying better because there's no brick and mortar. You're going online, you're not paying for all the um, overhead that would typically be charged by a bank. An emergency fund may need to be larger than six to 12 months of expenses if your income's variable. Somebody has a variable income up and down, well, you might need a larger buffer for those downtimes when the income is lower, right? And when income's higher, you need to save more during those times, not, not spend at all. So you can smooth out your income over the year. Okay. Those who do not have an emergency fund may unfortunately have to resort to credit cards. As we've mentioned, a wiser thing to do would be to save now in order to prepare for the inevitable that may or will happen later. Um, a study by the Brookings Institute, you'll see this in a footnote in your notes, footnote 85 from 2011, stated that... Um, Nearly one quarter of homes earning between 100 and 150,000 would have a difficult time coming up with $2,000 cash. One quarter would have a hard time just coming up with $2,000 cash, and the earnings are between 100 and 150,000. It's not income. Oh, if I just had more income. No, it's spending, right? Spending is, is the, the key to building savings, spending under income, no matter what level that income is. Now you can have the highest income, but if you're spending this much, it doesn't do you any good to have a high income, does it? If you're just spending, 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 okay? It is distressing to think that nearly half of all Americans, well, this doesn't just include the, those earning between 100 and 150,000, would probably or certainly be able to come up with $2,000 cash in the emergency situation. Nearly half. So don't be among them. Be wise. Save. Okay? Another reason for saving to meet future short-term goals. That might be a future car purchase where you save monthly until you build up enough cash on hand to where you can make the purchase with cash. Instead of credit, future home purchase, saving for a down payment on a home, right? These are goals. Do you have goals in mind? Like I said, we don't just save to save. We save for an emergency fund. That's practical. We save for larger purchases that are coming up. I know I'm going to have to eventually replace my car. I know that I want to purchase a home, so I have a goal in mind. I have a time frame in mind. Therefore, I save to reach that goal. And so when it's here, I now have the the savings set aside to make that purchase. Could be even to fund major home repairs, remodeling, right? Even annual vacations. You know, in our budget, we have a, a vacation fund, right? We're going to save up for a vacation because a lot of times you go on vacation, put it all on the credit card, you come back. That was really refreshing, and now you're immediately in panic mode because now we got to pay for it put it on the credit card. Now the anxiety starts all over and you need a, another vacation just to overcome that, right? So have a category for that. And I'm just giving you some examples, right? There's many others that you could, uh, for your own needs and determination for your own household, okay? So you determine the amount you'd like to spend, divide that by 12. All right, we wanna go on a, a vacation next year. Is there something Thank you, Siri. Siri must have thought I said, spoke her name. 
Um, so if there's you know, something you're saving for like a vacation, you set a budget for that, this is what we're gonna spend. And over the next 12 months, that's what we're gonna save. Divide that by 12 and save that for the vacation. And when the vacation's here, to vacation time, you've got the money. This is our budget, so this is what we're gonna use. To, we can't go over that budget on our vacation, so it may limit your options. Rather than just saying, we're just gonna go extravagant however we want to, put it on the credit card, then when we get home, we'll try to figure out how to pay it off. So that can be true for anything. Future major event, a wedding, anniversary, birth, whatever. Healthcare costs. Um, there's health savings accounts. Many of you may have a high deductible individual health care plan, insurance plan, and so you're offered a, an HSA health savings account, and so you can utilize that. Um, if you're not even sure what that is, I'm not going to get into the details of that. We can talk about that individually if you want. But any, even other infrequent purchases. Okay, I know my computer's going to um, not last more than three, five years, whatever it is. So let's put a little fund aside and save for that. Now you're probably thinking, man, I could have about 20 different categories of savings and all my income would go towards that. Well, you've got to pick and choose and, and make priority decisions with what you're going to save towards, what is practical, what you can do. Uh, and again, it's savings is coming after giving, not before giving. So this is after we've determined, determined you know, Lord, what, what you want us to give, what I, you want me to give, and putting that into practice before um, you determine what you're going to save and then live on. So it all has to work out, right? It all, it's kind of a zero-sum game. I have this amount of income, only so much is going to go to giving, so much is going to go to savings, so much is going to go to spending. So you have to be wise, judicious, discerning in how to appropriately um, determine that, those categories. Principles for saving. Pay yourself now. So when you have those jars, we give, we save. Basically we say, what we're saying here is pay yourself now is saving. I'm paying myself now so that I can provide for unforeseen needs, or even planned expenses in the future. Okay, so save a portion of your income. Just throwing out a rule of thumb there may or may not be applicable to you, but if you wanted somewhere to start, try to save 10% of your income. Determine your giving, and then try to say, okay, I, I haven't been a saver in the past. How can I work towards saving just 10% of my income? And for particular goals, you're starting to build with that savings amount, that 10%, an emergency fund. Get that emergency fund built up, then you're starting to plan for planned expenses in the future, starting to build that up. But you have to start somewhere, and you have to make some progress. If you can only save 5%, then do that. If you can save more, and it's appropriate for after all of your giving, then do that. Right? So no hard and fast um, amounts or percentages here. Just giving a rule of thumb. Next, always have a goal and time frame in mind for your savings because that's going to determine how much of risk you can take. If I want a down payment for a house in the next three years or five years, and I say, well, I'm just going to put it every dollar I save is gonna go into XYZ stock. What happens if XYZ stock takes a big fall in year four and you need these funds in year five? So time frame is very important. I can't take all that risk if I'm gonna need it in a short period of time. Right? You don't wanna, in a sense, just gamble that the markets will be up when you need those funds three years from now or five years from now. So your time frame is gonna help determine your level of risk. I have a longer time frame, I can be willing to take more risk because markets go through cycles of ups and downs. Okay, so this keeps us from what I call rating the cookie jar, 
when there's a desire to make a purchase that isn't within the budget. So if I'm saving, 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 I got a jar here full of savings and I don't have any goals for that, well, something can just come along and I can just raid that jar and just spend it unwisely. But I don't have any goals in mind, no time frame in mind. So the importance of having that time frame in mind and goals in mind. Okay? And also, keep in mind that the Lord may prompt you to give away savings to the needy or for a vital ministry purpose. Okay, Lord, we planned to um, buy XYZ at some point in the future. It's not a need, it's a want. But maybe we get to that point and the Lord is prompting you, you know what? I don't want you to use it for that. I want you to give it away. Be open to that. That's this kind of posture, right? Open hand. And see, you know, you just might experience a lot greater joy from that than you would from purchasing whatever you were going to purchase and deciding to do without maybe that luxury item or want. So always keep that in mind, that the Lord may have a different purpose for that. You may have your plans, but the Lord directs your steps, right? Uh, Short-term savings, vehicles, I probably am going to skip through number five here. You can read through those. It's just more practical stuff. I don't think it's, it's vital for us to cover here. So what I'm going to do, we're going to take a, a little break here, and then we'll have our final session, and we're going to be covering the fundamentals of investing. So we're going to switch gears from just sh saving short-term I'm going to talk about investing. All right, we're on the very home stretch now. All right, so our last session, and uh, hopefully we finish here in time. All right, so I'm going to start here. We're going to go through fundamentals of investing, and this is where I think your, your thinking is going to be challenged from the way you typically approach investing. Um, so let's talk about that here. All right? In its essence, when we're talking about investing, is simply supplying money or capital to a business in exchange for ownership of that business as well as the right to income or profits earned from that business. Someone comes to you and says, I want to start a business. Would you like to... Um, be involved in that. I need some capital. I need some money to do that. And so you say, yeah, I'll do that. What do I get in exchange for providing capital to you for this business? Well, you get an ownership portion, right? And if that business does well, your ownership value is going to increase. You also may have a right to, you do have a right to the income or the profits that are produced by that business as an owner. Right? So I have both the ability as an owner to participate in valuation increases if the business does well, but also the income flow, a portion of that income flow, a portion of the profits. Right? Is that true? Pretty fundamental, right? We've totally lost that in our investing philosophies. We've completely gone away from this fundamental understanding. And I'm just going to work our way through this, and hopefully you'll begin to see what I'm talking about how it's different, it's radically different than the way we approach investing today, okay? So first of all, investment equals ownership. When I invest in a company, I become a part owner of that company. True? It's true. And if I am an owner, that therefore means I have a responsibility for what that business does. The product it produces, the service it provides, how those employees are treated, how I obtain the raw materials if I'm producing a product that requires a process. I am an owner, and as an owner, we know that ownership is stewardship, right? 
So now I have the responsibility as an owner, basically also as a steward. Does that make sense? It's very fundamental, but we've missed this completely in our understanding of how we invest today. So in financial terms, assets equals, it's very simple um, uh, accounting equation here, assets equals liabilities plus equity. Equity is ownership. Whether I own a very small portion or a large portion, I still have equity or ownership in that company. So if I own 10% of a company, I'm an owner, right? I still have responsibility. What if I own 1%? Do I still have responsibility? I do. What if I own 0.00001% of that company? Do I still have ownership? Yeah. The point here is that percentage doesn't determine whether or not you have responsibilities as an owner. You do, no matter what, okay? Now, if we focus on leadership terms as an investor, so when I invest in a, a public company, um, as an investor, I am the one, along with all the other investors, who vote for the board of directors. Those board of directors get elected by those who are investing. Okay, so the, and then the board members determine who will be the CEO, and they determine the policies, the mission of the company. So in other words, investors control the company because they control the leadership of the company. The result is ownership responsibility. Not trying to trick you or take you down a path, it's, just, it's very simple, straightforward. This is just the way it is, right? Does that make sense? Okay. In responsibility terms, investors who are owners of the company have an ethical responsibility in regards to those policies, the mission, or the product or service that's produced by the company. And those products or services that are produced by the company are either going to have a positive impact or a negative impact on those who purchase and use or use them as well as even people around them. Does that make sense? Okay. I'll just use something like a, a baseball bat company. I'm using it for a particular purpose. That product can be used positive or negatively, right? I can use a baseball bat, go out there, little league, playing baseball, for enjoyment and fun, but that's, uh, that same baseball bat could be used to severely harm or kill someone as well, right? Okay, so we'll get into sort of the ethics of that, but you know, there's, there's a responsibility to produce a product that could be used for good or evil. Now, after it's taken away, um, that product, like a baseball bat, could be used for good or evil. I mean, I can't be responsible for what the people do after they purchase that. But I have the responsibility to produce a good product, right? Now, what could make that baseball bat harmful? Maybe I use some sort of, um, of finishing product on it that is toxic. And when people touch that, it gets toxins into their, into their body through the skin and causes them harm because I use some sort of cheap sort of material, would I be responsible for that? Yes, I would, because it's the actual product that's causing the harm, not the use of it, okay? So we'll, we'll get more into that as we get in. So regarding products produced, the investor's ethical responsibility starts and ends with the product produced. If I'm producing a good product, a good quality product, and there's nothing within that product that's gonna be harmful to people, and they go out and use it for evil, is it my responsibility as the manufacturer? No. I produced a good quality product. Someone else went out and misused that product. I never had the intention of a baseball bat use, being used to commit crimes or murder, right? So 
when I produce a product, because we have to have a line somewhere. Otherwise, we're going to get into all of these debates about what we're going to purchase, who we're going to purchase from, boycott this, boycott that. Do you understand why you would even boycott this or that? Maybe it's a company that's, they're not responsible. They've made a good product, but somebody else is going out and abusing that product and using it for evil. So now I'm going to make that company pay the price for that and cancel them in our current cancel culture? Okay, so I'm trying to build an argument of where the lines are as far as ethical responsibilities. Now, if it's in regards to a company that produces services or provides services, well, that ethical responsibility extends to how and to whom that service is provided, the impact it has on the client or the customer. I mean, I want to provide a service that causes harm to individuals. I want to provide a service that is beneficial to others and helpful to them, right? So there is a responsibility in providing that service that it does not cause harm to individuals, even maybe abuse of, of our stewardship responsibilities when it comes to the environment. I'm not talking about being environmentalists, okay? But if I go and use chemical in a pro chemicals in a process of producing a product, I don't want to go and take those chemicals and dump them out into a river that's downstream. There's a, a city or a town that's going to be negatively impacted by that health-wise, right? So even in my practices, I want to be ethical and wise there. Ownership through investment in a company may be diluted due to the multiplicity of shareholders in any one company, but that does not diminish the ethical responsibilities created by ownership. So whether I have one investor in a company, 10 investors, or 10 million investors, I'm one of 10 million investors in a company, I still have ownership. I still have, even if it's a meager percentage, I still have ownership. And that's the important thing to understand here. Ownership. Ownership equals responsibility. Now let's differ ownership from patronage. Patronage is the persons who buy the product or spend money for the service, pay a fee for a service, right? They are the patrons of a company who produces a product or provides a service. So there's a difference though in responsibility. Ethically speaking, it's vital to draw a clear distinction between the owner of a business and the patron of a business. As we've already talked about, there's very uh, practical reasons for that. An owner of a business is responsible for the products and their services it sells. We've already declared that. A patron makes choices regarding which products or services to purchase. An owner earns profits because of that ownership. Owner earns profits based on the sale of the products or services. The patron does not. Okay? So, can I go into the local 7-Eleven convenience store and buy a bottle of water when they also sell pornography or cigarettes or who knows, maybe even they're in, in, in the coming days, abortive fashions might be over the counter right at your convenience store. So if I go there, am I doing something immoral by purchasing a bottle of water? No, I'm not. Again, you've got to draw these proper lines or else you're not going to be able to buy anything anywhere, right? So that owner is responsible for what they are providing. But me, by going in there, it's, it's a different thing. I'm not profiting from the purchase. I'm, I'm the one buying. They're profiting from the purchase. And now you say, well, wait, I don't want them using my dollars to buy more products for this. I can't be responsible for that. 
you can't be responsible with what they do after the exchange has taken place with those dollars. Because I'm not an owner. Does that make sense? Following me? Okay. So next, the owner has differing responsibilities than the patron. Right, and we've talked about this here. So if an owner of a convenience store offers both alcohol and bottled water for sale, and not necessarily wrong to buy alcohol, but we know that alcohol can be abused. Water, probably not. I'm sure you could think of some sort of scenario where water can be harmful, but I don't think we need to go all the way down that road. Let's just keep this simple. Alcohol it can be abused, right? It can be enjoyed, certainly. Um, and there's no certain prohibition against that in Scripture, but it can certainly be abused. I mean, that's rather obvious. Okay, so owner of a convenience store offers both alcohol and bottled water for sale. The patron chooses to purchase water and not the alcohol. What is the patron encouraging the store owner to do? Stock more water, because that's what I'm here to buy. I'm not encouraging you to stock something that might be harmful because I'm not purchasing that, right? That's what I'm encouraging as a patron. So the patron is not responsible for the owner's choice of stocking alcohol, and the owner is not responsible for the patron's choice of buying bottled water. The two are separate. Even so, the owner's choice whether or not to stock alcohol is an ethical choice, and the patron's choice whether or not to purchase the alcohol is also an ethical choice. Especially if they go and they take that alcohol and abuse it, abuse their bodies with it, right? They've made an ethical choice. Okay, so what are we getting at? What are we getting at here? What's the bottom line? So the investor is an owner and therefore has greater responsibility than the patron because the owner offers products and services to the wider public and earns a profit from the sale of those products and services. While the patron, on the other hand, makes a choice as an individual whether or not to purchase that product or service. I can choose whether or not I want to purchase a product or a service. And I'm not the one who's profiting from that. I don't have the owner's same responsibility. Okay, you following me here? You're like, where are we going with this? Why are we going down this road? Well, hopefully, it, again, it will all fall together as we continue here. Okay, manufacturers and service providers differ from patrons. We've really already established that. But let's just delve a little bit deeper here. So, stepping back a little bit here. Prior to the transaction between the owner of a retail store and the patron, so we're stepping back from that and what the patron will do with that product, we're stepping back to take a look at you know, the manufacturer or the service provider. The manufacturer product or service provider has made a choice regarding what they're gonna produce or provide, right? When you say, I have a business plan, well, what are you doing? What is your basic premise and goal for that business plan. We're gonna produce X, Y, and Z and sell it. Or we're going to provide service ABC and sell it for a fee, right? You gotta make that decision. So an owner has to make that decision. That manufacturer's or service provider's choice is an ethical choice. We're either gonna produce something that's gonna benefit people or we're going to produce something that's going to harm people or we're going to produce something that you know when it gets to the end user they might use it for good they might use it for evil but it's not our intention to produce this product so that they will use it for evil right it has a specific intention it can be used for either way but there's an ethical choice there so if I'm a starting a manufacturing business or a service provider business, I need to think carefully about what I'm going to make. I don't just go out into the marketplace and say, I can make a lot of money from producing XYZ and not think through the ethical implications of that. 
cigarettes are very profitable, right? So let's, if we want profits, let's get into a, a business that sells a product that makes a large profit. Who cares about the ethics of it? We can't do that as believers. I can't. Can't profit from that. And I'll just give you an anecdote. In the firm that I work for, um, a father and uh, two of his four sons are in this business. And the father's been in, in the business for 50 years, sons probably for 25, 30 years. Um, but as the sons were getting into the business, uh, the father had certain investments for the clients. And one of the two sons came to him one day and said, what do you think about profiting from Philip Morris? Philip Morris is a cigarette manufacturer, right? And so the dad said, I think it's great. It's really profitable. And the son said, well, do you realize we're profiting from the misery that's caused by these cigarettes? There's nothing good coming from this to the end user. It's all harmful. And the father had never thought about that before. And just set him on a different trajectory. Say, okay, we're going to get rid of all of that. All of our holdings of Philip Morris, we're going to get rid of, even though it's profitable. Because we do need to think through the ethics of this. When we buy stock in Philip Morris, now we're owners, and there's ethical responsibility there. Do we want to profit from that? So the question is, how you profit matters. Okay? So when I make a choice, do you even just as a manufacturer or producer, I've got to make wise choices. As an investor, I have to make those same wise choices. What am I going to invest in? Is what I'm investing in causing great harm to others? My guess is that if any of you in here are working for a company that has a 401k and you've made your options to what you're going to invest in, if I asked you, can anyone tell me what companies you are invested in? I would say the vast majority, with minor exceptions, would say, I have no idea what companies I'm invested in. Because investing in today's vernacular is putting money into this market and the market performs and I get profits from that. Rather than thinking through I'm investing in individual companies. Even if I'm investing in a mutual fund that holds 100, 200, 3,000 different companies within that mutual fund, I need to be able to understand what I'm investing in. I need to know because I am an owner and I have responsibility there. Okay? So, you know, what I produce can be amoral meaning there's no necessary ethics involved. So this smartphone, right? We all have one. It can be used for good or evil. Me buying this is not buying an evil product, but I can certainly use it for evil, right? Or I can use it for good. Something immoral, producing an abortifacient, pharmaceutical drug. Do you want to really own a company that produces that in your portfolio, however small that percentage is, and yet we're here and we would talk about the sanctity of human life. All along, I'm owning a company that's fighting against the very principles that I hold dear, the very beliefs that I hold dear. So that's the caution here. Or you could produce a moral product. I mean, hopefully we would say producing Bibles, that's a moral product, right? That's a good product, okay? Then we could go on here. We're, we're getting close to our time here. But uh, the manufacturing process itself also needs to be brought through the same grid of ethics, right? Amoral, I'm using aluminum to produce smartphones. Immoral. I'm dumping harmful chemicals into the environment in the manufacturing process. I might be producing a product that is fine, but I, my manufacturing process could be out of line. Or a moral aspect of my 
process is I'm providing fair wages and healthy working conditions for my employees. So a biblical warning to avoid immorality and unethical business ownership and practices. I'm not going to read through this. You can read through Proverbs 1 and take it and apply it in the context of companies and products and services. All right? I won't do that. So you can take a look at that. But the conclusion here is investors are shareholders owning a stake in a company and must make wise choices through the provision of capital into various business ventures based upon leadership, vision, mission, ethics, products, and services. And so just understand that there are mutual fund companies out there, there are financial advisors out there that can help us make wise choices and pick companies that are a blessing and a benefit to people and screen out the companies that are harmful, producing products or services that are harmful to people. That exists now today. And because that exists, you know, there's a certain responsibility we have now to pursue that. I'm not asking you to go out and analyze 100 different companies and try to figure this out. Because there are others who are out there already doing that for you. There is access to those kinds of services. Even online, you can get access to those kinds of services. So what I'm trying to get you to do is think differently, going back to what the fundamentals of investing are, producing capital for a business to produce a product or service, rather than I'm throwing my money into the market and hoping for a great return. And that's the whole point of the next session when I, I just don't have time to go through this all. But we can have, I know I put verses here, and in a sense, performance driven versus principle driven. Sometimes those can be at odds, but really you can bring those together. I can both go out and invest my dollars for the pursuit of positive performance to grow and increase while also implementing principle-driven investing or what we might call values-based investing these days. So rather than getting into all the details of what to invest in, how to invest, this, that, all those practical mechanics, I want to here, my goal was just to impact your thinking and to start saying, okay, I have principles when it comes to my giving, right? I'm not just throwing my money anywhere to any charity for any purpose. Oh, Planned Parenthood, they're a charity. Let's just give there. Am I going to do that? No, I have certain discernment and principles. Okay, I'm going to give to the church. I'm going to give to you know, organizations that are wisely using the funds, they're good stewards of those funds, they're actually helping people, and they don't have huge administrative costs, and they're, um, you know, Children's Hunger Fund, or like I said, Johnny and Friends, or something like that. They're actually doing things, and there's hundreds of others we could name here. But you understand the point. Take that same grid of thinking and transfer it to your investing if you are involved investing at all, and most people do have some sort of access to like a 401k or something. A lot of the 401ks, we, there's nothing we can do about the choices that are there. I understand that, okay? But when it comes to my own individual, if I can do something, if I can make choices in my 401k that screen these things out, great. If I can you know, work with an advisor or do things on my own, that allow me to screen these out. And there's, like I said, many resources out there for this. There's many great mutual fund companies out there that do this already. If I can do that and take that same mentality, that's going to transform my thinking. Because now I don't only have a vested interest in earning a positive return. I have a vested interest in seeing the companies I'm invested in produce products or services that benefit people, whether that be in the, the healthcare realm or you know, the, um, 
waste management realm, a company that's providing a good service, a company that is treating its customers well, a company that's treating its employees well, a company that's not just causing damage to the environment needlessly. Now I have the joy of seeing what God has designed us to do as stewards over his creation. Right? Are we not, we're stewards in a micro sense over all we've been talking about here, but are we not stewards in a macro sense, in the sense that in Genesis 1, God created everything and he gave dominion to all of creation, to mankind, right? That's what he did. So when we're involved in investments in companies that are doing things throughout the world, creating products and services, we want to be involved in those that are having, you know, the proper kind of dominion over God's creation and causing, bringing about good instead of harm. Right? So I didn't have the opportunity to go through every detail here of the notes, but I want you just to really take hold of that. You can take a look at some of the resources that are available there. But uh, does that, you know, we're, we're here at two o'clock already, but uh, does that generate any questions? Because I'm sure you're sitting there going, never thought about that that way before. Or what about this? What about that? Just yeah. Start wondering about uh, when you were talking about being a patron. Yeah. Um, are you talking about like buying water at the store that's not delivered? Yeah. Yeah. Trends. Right. Uh, weird. Sure. For kids. Yeah. Would that kind of fall under the same thing? Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's a matter of conscience for you. Should I go into a store like Target currently is, you know, affected by woke ideology and they're selling all this LGBTQ plus stuff, especially for kids. And should I boycott that? Well, eventually, I mean, every part of society is going to be infiltrated by that. And you're not going to be able to go anywhere to buy anything if you have the mentality, I can't go there. I'll still go to Target. But someone else may have a conviction that they're not going to. And I have to respect that, and I will. I'll respect that. You don't want to go there. You don't want to support that. I understand that. But again, that's why I said we've got to draw those lines somewhere, some way. Think of um, Paul giving the example of buying meat that has been offered to idols. Is the meat now contaminated because it was offered to idols? Is it immoral meat? No. For those of us, and he said, those who are mature and have an understanding, they understand that meat, there's nothing different about that meat than what you would buy in a different marketplace. Nothing different about it. Can I buy it there? Yes, I can in good conscience buy it there and enjoy that meat. Well, didn't you just contribute to the temple? No, I just bought meat that was offered, sacrificed to idols. But an idol is nothing, is what Paul, is nothing, there's nothing, there's no real God there being offered to it. So um, hopefully there's some principles there we can draw out to take an understanding that there are certain lines drawn. But if your brother says, no, I can't eat that, Yes, I want to demonstrate love and say, okay, I won't eat that either. We're at this person's house. They're offering it to us. But my weaker brother says, I can't eat that. I won't. Okay? So there's got to be that kind of love driven as well. Yes? The argument I think also, and I haven't thought of this very much as an The argument often goes that if I am a patron,
Yeah, and that's what I've tried to argue here, that as a patron, I have a different set of responsibilities than that owner would. I mean, look at the products you see right in front of you, right? What does this company stand for? But am I an owner of that company? I'm not owning that stock, um, but I will buy their products because I can use their products. I'm using, right now I'm using it for good, for the benefit of the building of the body, right? So uh, if I've got to draw that line, I may not even be able to own any computer or a smartphone or any kind of technology because they're all going to be pro LGBT and supporting all that stuff. So that's why I say you've got to draw that line. Where's my responsibility end as a patron? Where does it start and end versus the responsibilities held by the actual company and what they do with those profits, right? So am I contributing to their profits? Yes, but I'm not responsible for what they do with those profits. That's kind of the line where I would draw. And it does require thinking. And we need to continue that dialogue and that process and that conversation. Yes. I guess I got a few questions, but first you were referencing the Apple logo there. I have no understanding of what happens on the internal side of the company or anything, but obviously it is kind of a reference to the culture, the knowledge and all that. And so with that son in law where you would you would not want to invest in so you don't invest in Apple for any reason. Yeah, I probably would not invest in Apple, but that's that's my choice too. Um because now I'm an owner and I'm responsible for what that company actually promotes and does. As a patron, I'm not. So that's where I draw the different line, okay? But you've got to make those determinations with conscience as well. Was there a second question? Two? Yeah. Yeah, if that makes it easier for you to track things, that's fine. Because they're not any real cost to you. It's just, you know, you've got to keep track of a lot more accounts now than you did before. But you can simply use something like some budgeting software that says, the budgeting software says, I don't care where the funds are, I will divide up the categories. Okay, I can have $10,000 in a savings account and in my categories in my budget, I can divvy that up between, well, 6,000 is for the emergency fund, 2,000 is for this. And so I see it categorized in that budgeting software. By the way, I highly recommend YNAB, you need a budget. <laughs> we have a thumbs up. All right, I've got one, one patron here <laughs> of that company. So uh, I've been using that for about 10 years for our household. Anyway, not trying to give a plug for them. I don't get anything for that. So anyway, but I use that. So um, yeah, it's a decision. If it makes it easier just to have different accounts, then do that. But I think you know a more efficient way would be to track it somewhere to where I know, hey, I have this much set aside in that savings account for this particular purpose, this particular category. Okay, and was there a follow-up? Anywhere else? No? All right. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, the, the value of the dollar symbol continues to go down and down. Um, what are your thoughts in, in time with the bonus or overage that we're going to see in the continuing years? You know, as we move to um, yeah. currency. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, Buying gold, silver, uh, we do a portion of that for our clients, but it's, it's within a set portfolio. It says, okay, this percentage will put in gold, for example, and we're buying a gold exchange-traded fund, which means we don't own actual gold, but it's tracking the value of gold. Okay, so um, we would say it's wise to allocate and diversify so maybe only a portion, but we're gonna put the rest in different categories of stocks, bonds, mutual funds, um, real estate, whatever that is. So uh, that doesn't get directly to your question, but your, the question is really, should we 
be buying gold because of what's happening to the dollar and the inflation. Well, certainly uh, gold is a good hedge against inflation. And if you look what happen has happened with gold over the last six months or so, you've got about a 20% increase in value, whereas you know what has been happening with inflation. So, um, but prior to that, it, it lost for several times. So gold itself is a good storehouse of value, but I wouldn't say that it's necessarily a, a good investment because it doesn't produce any interest or dividends. It's just a store of value, right? So that's a good thing. Um, you know, what's going on with the currency? Is the dollar going to just completely be dethroned? I don't think anytime soon. I mean, the talking heads on TV would have you believe that the dollar is just about ready to go the way of the dodo bird. It's just not. It can't yet. It would take time. There may be a transition to, um, you know, electronic currencies, right? Um, but right now, the dollar is still king, and the vast majority of major transactions that take place throughout the world are happening with the dollar, even in spite of what's going on with the you know, Chinese currency, and um, even in South America, what they're doing, <clears throat> um, trying to get away from the dollar. So yes, you're gonna face, face inflation. Um, best way to you know, overcome or at least keep up with inflation is with a, a well-diversified portfolio that's going to stay ahead of inflation. Just going into gold, I mean, we don't wanna put all our eggs in one basket, simply speaking. Because if that basket falls and the eggs in that basket, what's gonna to happen to all of them? They're all gonna break, right? That's why we diversify many different baskets. Because if one of those baskets falls, it doesn't impact all the others, right? So there are gonna be different baskets who perform differently, better or worse. Bigger eggs versus smaller eggs, more produced eggs versus less, if you're adding in the chickens to the equation, right? So being wisely diversified is the best thing you can do. The rest you can't, you know, I've had clients call me and say, well, what are you gonna do? What are you doing to prepare for the fall of the dollar? So well, what can we do? We can be our, only control is over the diversification where we place the funds we have. I cannot control what happens with the dollar. I cannot control what happens with the overall markets. I cannot control the events that are gonna come about unexpectedly through wars and COVID-19 and et cetera. I can't control that. I can only control the diversification, where I'm placing things in the pie. And if I'm well diversified, that's the best protection, okay? Simple answer, there's probably a lot more complexity to it, um, but hopefully that helps a little bit, okay? All right, so I know we're 2.15. Thank you so much for your indulgence, in a sense, of, of starting later today, going a little bit longer. Thank you for participating in this. Let me close us up in prayer. Just give thanks to the Lord. Father, we are thankful for um, just the wise, the wisdom, the, the wise words that we find in your, your word, in your scriptures. And I just pray that you help us to be wise and discerning stewards that are, are faithful and trustworthy and that this, uh, even this course would provide value to your body, that we might be even better stewards. We thank you for um, just the greatest gift that could be given to us in your son, Jesus Christ, and the salvation we have that we do not deserve. We give you thanks for that. Help us to be, have hearts of gratitude and give thanksgiving continually to you for, for your indescribable gift. We pray this in your name. Amen.